Hi everybody and welcome to this Entheos Academy class on how to get from stuck to started. My name is Hannah Brain. I run a website called Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at becomingwhoyouare.net. And in a nutshell, I help people do things that are better for them. So if you are listening to this today, this class is going to be perfect for you. If you have a big meaty project or goal that is really sitting in your heart right now, that's something you really want to get going on, but you're either struggling to take that first step and finding it really hard just to get started, or you started and you found that halfway through, you've stalled a little bit. So wherever you're at with your project, if the title resonates with you, if you want to go from stuck to started, then keep watching because I'm going to be sharing 10 big ideas on how you can do exactly that. So let's dive straight in to big idea number one. This is remember that action beats perfection. I wanted to start with this because perfectionism is one of the key ways that we self-sabotage when it comes to our big projects and our big goals. Perfectionism really, really keeps us stuck when we go chasing this ideal that I know deep down we all know doesn't really exist, no such thing, perfect. But when we go chasing that ideal, we are far more likely just to not take any action at all because we're putting tons of pressure on ourselves, we're putting the bar way, way too high. And in the long run, it's totally not helpful for the goals and the projects that we really want to achieve. Ultimately, perfection is an ego defense, right? It's something that protects our ego from potential failure, from potentially looking silly, and also from some other more subtle things. Like perfectionism can protect our ego from that uncomfortable feeling that comes with being a beginner, right? With all projects, wherever we have, we have to start sometimes and we have to be, we have to start sometimes as a beginner. You know, let's take writing a novel as an example. If you really want to write a novel, but you've never written a novel before, in order to write that novel, you're going to have to sit with that discomfort of being a beginner and feeling like you just don't know what you're doing to begin with. JK Rowling had that feeling, right, when she first started writing and part of what has contributed to her massive success today is her tenacity and her willingness to sit with that feeling of being a beginner and to write and write until she didn't feel like a beginner anymore. Something else that perfectionism can really protect our ego from is that gap between what the project looks like in our heads and what it ends up looking like in reality. You know, once we start manifesting a project into the real world, once we start turning it into something tangible and working on it, we might find that we have to tone it down here or tone it up there. And sometimes this gap between this incredible vision that we had and what it's actually looking like right now in the real world, it can be kind of disappointing or kind of frustrating, or it might not live up to our own expectations of ourselves. And at that point, it might be really tempting to stop and to quit. And we might create all these little blocks for ourselves that lead us to get stuck. Yeah. Ultimately, whatever you're doing, whatever the project is that you're working on, creating is a really vulnerable activity, right? Creativity is vulnerability. And so what I'd encourage you to do is instead of looking for perfection, is to aim for mastery, right? So it's not about being perfect. It's just about being the best that you can be at any particular activity. And the slight irony here is that in order to achieve mastery at something, you need to take action on it, right? It's taking that action, getting that practice, shipping something, to use Seth Godin's terminology, then getting the feedback on it and being able to iterate and improve, right? That is what's gonna to lead to mastery. But every step along the way, in order to do that, you're gonna to need to take action on it. So there's two mantras that I wanna share with you that have really helped me get from stuck to started when it comes to my own struggle with being a little bit perfectionist with some things and having that hold me back. The first thing is the, or the first mantra is the name of this big idea, which is action beats perfection. So the next time you find yourself stuck in this headspace of, oh, well, you know, it's not quite right, therefore I can't put it out yet, or I need to wait until this tiny detail is sorted out, or I need to wait until I'm better at this skill, or the stars have aligned in this way, right? We all have those kinds of thoughts. 
instead of thinking that, just to repeat to yourself, action beats perfection. Another one that's really, really powerful is done is better than perfect. Super, super powerful one. Done is better than perfect. So as you go through and as you think about the project and as you come up against any little challenges that are keeping you stuck, just keep those two mantras in your head. Action beats perfection and done is better than perfect. And use them, repeat them to yourself whenever you need to course correct and steer away from perfectionism and steer towards mastery. Big idea number two, ask yourself, am I in love with the idea of this goal or with the reality? One way of looking at this big idea is to look at the difference between extrinsically motivated goals and intrinsically motivated goals. Extrinsically motivated goals are things that we do in order to get external validation, right? To get accolades or to get certificates or to get a big stamp of approval that we are qualified to do something or accredited in that profession or whatever. Whereas intrinsically motivated goals are things that we do primarily because we really want to do them. So there might be some overlap with those extrinsic goals that I mentioned. So we might be intrinsically motivated to pursue a particular profession or qualification or degree or whatever. The key difference is our primary motivation. Does it come from you internally? Or does it come from wanting this external validation and the sense of false security that comes with that? This is where this idea of the um, whether we're in love with the idea of the goal or the reality of the goal really comes in. Quite often with extrinsically motivated goals, we are in love with the idea of having met that goal, right? We picture in our head how great it's going to feel when we have achieved that goal. Whereas with intrinsically motivated goals, often what is really motivating us is the process of working towards that goal. And that's the really key, important difference. So earlier I mentioned writing a novel as an example, and this is a really great example for this big idea too. If you have, uh, if you like the idea of writing a novel, maybe you picture how it's going to feel when it's done. Uh, maybe you can imagine how great it's going to feel when you can say to yourself, "Hey, I wrote a novel." When you can see the novel, maybe in the you know, front window of your local Barnes and Nobles or something like that. Uh, when you can say to other people, yeah, I wrote this book, when you can have your own Amazon page and you can see how great that's gonna feel. But the reality of writing a novel, as you might know if you've done it, is quite different from that, right? There's all the stuff that comes before that point, which involves lots of working on your own, um, spending lots of time and energy on things like character development, working out tricky plot points, getting stuck, uh, working through writer's block, being willing to put your, you know, horrible first draft, because everybody's first draft is horrible, but being willing to put your horrible first draft out there and get feedback and constructive criticism. And then if you want to go down the publishing route, you know, looking for an agent, writing a proposal, all of that stuff is stuff that you will need to do if you want to get to that endpoint. And if that stuff leaves you feeling lukewarm or if it's even, you know, a hell no, which it absolutely is for some people, that's totally fine. It just means that this is probably not the goal for you or it's almost certainly not the goal for you. That's why it's really, really important to ask, am I in love with the idea of this goal or with the reality of this goal? If we're in love with the reality, we're far more likely to get beyond that stuck point, get started and really make progress on it. Whereas if we're just in love with the idea, you know, sometimes feeling stuck on a goal isn't necessarily something that we need to overcome. Sometimes it's a sign that what we're doing isn't quite aligned with our values or with our priorities. And it might be that if you're in that place right now and you're thinking, actually, yeah, when I think about how I think about this goal and how I've approached it, what I'm really looking forward to is that fleeting moment at the end when I've met it, rather than the process of working towards it, then it could be that you are um, in love with the idea more than the reality and that actually your stuckness is a sign that this is not the right goal for you. So focusing on the reality is so, so important because ultimately, like I said, you know, that part where you've met the goal, that is fleeting. But the bit where you're working towards it, right, that huge long section, which for some goals is the years and years of our lives, that is what you're going to be living day in, day out. And ultimately, that is the part that is going to make up your life.
So really focus on the reality of the goal and think to yourself, am I in love with the ideas or with the reality? Big idea number three, find your big why. Our big whys help us reaffirm uh, and stoke our internal passion, right? They are a really great way of tapping into that intrinsic motivation that I was just talking about. And the reason why it's so helpful for us to tap into our big why is that once we can do that, when we can really dig down and identify, okay, why is it that I wanna do this thing? Why is this goal so important to me? Then eventually, if we dig down enough, that why will become more powerful than whatever is holding us back right now. And that is when we're gonna get that motivation and that movement that helps us get from stuck to started. So questions to ask yourself to identify your big why are things like, how does this project help me express my core values, right? It's a really big one. We all have a set of core values. And if you can identify how this project fits in with your core values and bring that to your conscious awareness, that's gonna help you tap into your big why and that intrinsic motivation a lot more successfully. Another question you can ask is, which of my core needs does this project meet? You know, that's a really key part of why you're doing this. What needs does it meet for you? Other questions are things like, how do I want to feel? Right, if you've done, if you've heard of Danielle Laporte and done any work with her Desire Map program, you'll probably be very familiar with this question, but it's such an important thing, right? Sometimes when we are faced with a big project or goal, we focus on what do I need to do or what do I want to do? What are the steps I need to take? And we focus on the doing part, whereas what she suggests is focusing on how do I want to feel and then using that to set our goals. So as you're looking for your big why with this particular goal or project that you're feeling a bit stuck on now, think how do I want to feel and how will this project help me experience those feelings? You can also ask how does this project enable me to share my gifts and strengths with the world. In The Happiness Advantage, which is a fantastic book by Sean Aker, he talks about how people, studies have shown that people who exercise their top strengths each day are happier people. So if you can tie how this project helps you exercise your top strengths, that's gonna leave you feeling a lot more intrinsically motivated to get started. So that's how does this enable me to share my gifts and strengths with the world? Finally, a really deep question that I love asking myself when it comes to projects is how will this impact my life for the better and how will it impact other people's lives for the better too? This is really tapping into your legacy and obviously not every project comes with a huge legacy, right? Some things are just maybe gonna only affect our lives or they're gonna affect maybe our lives and one other person, but that still counts still really, really counts because if you think about the difference that you're making to your life, even with the tiniest of tiny projects or the difference that you're making to somebody else's life, that has a huge ripple effect, right? And it might have a huge impact on that other person's life, even though it's just one person. So really think about the legacy, such, such a powerful thing and think, how will this project impact my life for the better? And how will it impact other people's lives too? Big idea number four, is make friends with your fears. So we try, I don't know about you, my, my default response to fear sometimes when I'm having a day when I'm not particularly self-aware, not particularly connected to myself is to try and avoid doing the thing that I feel afraid of doing, whether that's something really tiny, like sending an email or really big, like, you know, having a sort of super difficult conversation with someone or you know, pitching a really big project or whatever. We all have our different responses to fear because quite often in our heads, right, we feel fear, fear is uncomfortable, and we equate that with bad, right? So the first thing to remember about fear is that uncomfortable is not the same as bad. And uncomfortable is not necessarily bad either. Feeling uncomfortable is not necessarily bad. Feeling fear is also not a sign that we shouldn't do something, right? Sometimes it's actually the opposite. Sometimes the things that we are most afraid of doing, particularly if they involve like stretch goals, things that are going to expand our comfort zone, those are the things that we really should be doing because the fact that we're so afraid of them means is a sign that we really, really care about them. If we didn't care about them, we wouldn't feel so afraid of doing them. So those are the first two things to think about fear is to remember that fear feels uncomfortable, but it's not necessarily bad. And also to remember that fear is not proof 
that you shouldn't be doing the thing that you want to do. The third thing to remember about fear, and this is where making friends with your fear really comes in, is to remember that all feelings have a purpose, right? All feelings have something really valuable to communicate to us. They are there for a reason. We're feeling fear for a reason. And so what you need to be do, willing to do is to be willing to listen, right? And that starts with really accepting and letting yourself experience the fear. Sometimes with uncomfortable feelings like fear, we might fear that we, if we really allow ourselves to feel it, and if we really allow it to trigger us, that we're just going to get kind of taken over by it, and that we're going to feel this way forever, and that's going to be it, and it's going to kind of take hold, and we're going to be fearful for good. Whereas actually the opposite is true. When we fight against the feeling, that's when it usually becomes more intense and uncontrollable. Whereas if we just allow ourselves to feel it, just that simple act of allowing and embracing it often helps that feeling dissipate. Sounds very counterintuitive, but I promise you, <laughs> it's true. So that's the first step, is allowing ourselves to feel the fear and just letting it wash over us. Then the second step is to get really curious about it. And this is where the making friends part comes in, right? Is to get really, really curious, to accept and get curious. So to ask yourself, you know, where am I feeling this fear in my body? How is it showing up physiologically for me? What is this fear about, right? What, what is the belief or the beliefs behind this fear. Maybe there's more than one belief that's contributing to your fear. Is there an element of truth in this fear? Because sometimes fear is alerting us, as I said, you know, all feelings have a purpose. And sometimes fear is alerting us to the fact that you know, maybe we haven't prepared as well as we could do for that particular public speaking gig. Or maybe there is a little bit more research that we could have done for that project or that ebook that we're about to put out, right? Sometimes our fear it has a really strong purpose in that way, where it's alerting us to something that we maybe need to pay a little bit more attention to. Another question to ask yourself when you're getting curious about your fear is, is this my fear or is it a fear that I've internalized from someone else? So what messages did I get that have contributed to this fear? You know, often as a kid, like when we're you know, most impressionable, when we're still learning how the world works, when we're still kind of growing and becoming who we are as adults, right? We internalize all these messages from people around us. And what that means is that as well as the really good stuff, sometimes we also end up internalizing other people's fears. So they're not actually our fears, but we are almost feeling them for other people. And then the final question that I find really helpful to ask myself when it comes to fear, you know, once you've shown yourself that curiosity and once you've gotten a much deeper understanding of what's behind that fear is, what would I do differently without this fear? So what would I do differently if I didn't feel this fear? And just sit with how that response, you know, you will get a kind of gut response to what the next course of action would be if you didn't feel that fear. And just sit with the idea of taking that action. Big idea number five is to get accountable. Multiple studies have shown that there are two things that really help us and make it far more likely that we achieve our goals. The first thing is writing our goals down, super, super helpful, writing them down either in a journal or just on your wall, wherever the case is, but writing them down, getting them out of your head and making them turning them into something tangible in the real world, even if it's just words written on a page, is super powerful. The other thing, which is the thing that I wanna talk about today, is getting accountability, because that in particular can be really, really helpful from getting us from stuck to started. Accountability is really, really simple, right? All you need to do, and I say it's, I say it's simple, it's not necessarily easy, because otherwise, that there wouldn't be much point in accountability, right? Because the whole purpose of it is that you need to be willing to take the risk to share your, your big project, either the end goal or even your next milestone with somebody else, you know, ideally multiple people who are gonna come back to you at some stage and say, hey, have you done this yet? And you know, the best way to do this is to say to people, okay, I'm committing to doing this milestone or reaching this milestone or completing this project by this date and being really specific about what you're going to do and by when. Because even if those people don't come back to us, and ideally we want to find people who are going to be supportive, and ideally who have been through a similar process themselves and have reached similar goals themselves so that they understand what we're going through. But not all of us have a community like that around us. And not, you know, sometimes if we're real trailblazers, right, we're not necessarily going to have people around us who have done the same things that we want to do. And that's totally fine. 
just the act of telling people often, even if they don't come back, you know, a couple of weeks later or closer to the deadline that you set and say, hey, how's it going? Just that act of telling people and being publicly accountable to people, it sort of switches on our ego and it makes our ego work for us, right? Because then we don't want to let other people down, right? We don't want to be that person who says they're going to do something and then doesn't do it. We don't want people to think we're flaky or that we don't follow through. And although, you know, you want to be really careful about how you use that kind of motivation for yourself, it can be a really positive way to kick your ego into touch and really get it working for you rather than against you. So that is getting accountable. As I said, you know, ideally you want to find people who are going to be supportive of you. Don't necessarily want to find people who are going to try and talk you out of your big goal or dream, especially if you're feeling a bit stuck yourself right now. But a lot of times, even just the act of telling someone in itself is enough to, as I said, kick your ego into touch and get you going because you want to meet that deadline that you set publicly. Big idea number six use the pleasure pain principle. So just as I've just talked about how we can be accountable to other people and how that can be a really effective way of getting from stuck to started, another person who we often don't hold ourselves accountable to, but who is equally, if not more important to hold ourselves accountable to is our future self. If you think about it, everything that we do today and all the choices that we make, the things that we decide to do, the thing, things that we decide not to do, us as we are today, this version of ourselves right now, we don't have to live with the consequences of those decisions. The person that has to live with the consequences of those decisions is our future self, right? It's ourselves tomorrow. It's ourselves in a week or a month or in years. And this is especially the case with these big, hairy, audacious goals that we set, you know, the things where we might struggle to get from stuck to started because they're either really big or they're really meaningful or they're stretch goals. Right? The person who's really, really going to be affected by whether or not we do get from stuck to started is not us today. It's us in six months time or a year's time or you know, however long, depending on which goal you're working on. So for this pleasure pain, pain principle, I would love to use an analogy and I'm going to use the movie Sliding Doors. I don't know if you've seen that movie. But uh, the gist of it is that there's a woman in, well, it's Gwyneth Paltrow in London, and in she sort of gets divided into these parallel universes. And in one universe, she gets on a train, she meets this guy, they fall in love, it's all very romantic and ends very sadly. I won't give it away too much. But then in the other scenario, in the other parallel universe, she misses the train. And so the film shows these two, how that one action, that one action of missing the train or catching the train just sends her world like in two completely divergent directions, or so you think. But for the purpose of this, <laughs> for the purpose of this class, we will say two completely divergent directions. Okay, so we can use a scenario for ourselves and we can think, you know, imagine it's you six months from now. And in fact, what I would love you to do right now, if you can, obviously don't do anything that's going to be unsafe, but if you can, just sit really upright in your chair, just close your eyes, take a couple of deep breaths, make sure your feet are flat on the floor, nice and grounded. And just imagine yourself in six months time and really think about you know, where you are, maybe you're sitting in, in exactly the same place. Um, imagine who you're around, right? What can you hear? What can you smell? Really paint that picture of yourself six months from now and really step into you know, imagining that you are that person right now. And then as you're imagining that person, as you're feeling your way into becoming that six month later version of yourself, imagine scenario one, right? And this is a scenario where you have gone from stuck to started and you've made progress in your goal. Maybe you've even finished your goal, okay, depending on how big it is. And I really want you to visualize and really feel on a tangible physical level how it feels to look back at the last six months and to know that you have either made progress or finished that project, right? And I want you to think also around the goal. So think about what has changed in your life as a result of you finishing or making progress on that project, right? What's different in your life? How do you feel about yourself as a result of doing that? And what other areas of your life has this impacted? Right, so what other areas of your life outside the goal again has getting started or finishing that goal 
change, right? Maybe there's other stuff that you want to do and making progress on this goal has given you the confidence to go ahead and do that. It's given you the impetus and the motivation to do that. But just sit with that for a couple of moments. And then I want you to go back to imagining your sort of neutral self in six months time. And for scenario two, for the second parallel universe, I want you to imagine that you haven't gone from stuck to started. So I want you to imagine that for the last six months, you have still been stuck on this goal. And I want you to run through those same questions for yourself again. And again, really feel into it and feel how it, the experience on a physiological level. How do you feel about the fact that you have been stuck for the last six months? How, what has, what has changed in your life? as a result of feeling stuck, or maybe what would you have liked to have changed that has stayed the same as a result of you being stuck? What other areas of your life has staying stuck impacted? And how do you feel about yourself knowing that you have stayed stuck over the last six months? So we're just rushing through this exercise now. What I'd really encourage you to do is to take a good sort of 10, 20 minutes, even meditate on it, and really feel into those two eventualities, those two parallel universes. Because right now, you are at that crossroads where you can either get on the train or you can miss the train, you know, metaphorically speaking, right? You can either get started or you can stay stuck, and that is completely within your control. And so if you can really look ahead and really see where those two paths diverge and where each of them end up and really feel into how it's going to feel to be yourself living with the consequences of either staying stuck or getting started, then that can be a really, really helpful stimulation uh, for getting going and getting moving on your big project, right? It provides a helpful perspective. So you can go back to that exercise as many times as you need to. Um, it doesn't need to be something that you just do once and then put to bed. Like it can be something that you keep going back to, keep going back to, keep going back to whenever you feel a little bit stuck. But really focus in, as I said, on how it feels on a physical level to be that version of yourself in both of those scenarios. And just visualize, you know, what it's going to be like, how great it's going to feel when you get started or you've even finished and how you're gonna feel if you're still stuck in six months as well, and how that's gonna affect your relationship with yourself, how it's gonna affect other areas of your lives, um, of your life, sorry, <laughs> we're not cats, <laughs> we have one life, and how it's also going to maybe impact other areas of your life too. Big idea number seven is to start with just five minutes. This is a really, really simple technique but like a lot of simple techniques, it's really, really effective too. This is particularly useful if the reason that you're feeling stuck is because you're on a, we're working on a project that is huge, right? It's in fact, it's so huge that it actually feels kind of overwhelming right now, or there's so many different moving pieces that you're just not sure where to start. The way this works is, like I said, very, very simple. And it really rests on just giving yourself permission to stop after five minutes. Right. So the idea is that you, you set a rule for yourself that you're going to work on this particular project for five minutes every day for just five minutes. This works because even if you stop after five minutes, and the one thing I would say is that if you give yourself permission to stop after five minutes, it's really, really important that you honor that. Right. So even if you do stop after five minutes, the fact is that if you think about after a week, you're going to have spent 35 more minutes on that project than spending no time on that project, right? So you're gonna be, even though it's not a huge difference perhaps, you're still gonna be a little bit further ahead. If you think about how much of a difference that's gonna make over a month, uh, my math is not that great off the top of my head, but it's a significant number of minutes more than zero, which is how many minutes you're spending on it while you're stuck, and then over a year and so on. So even just spending those five minutes a day, even if you never spend longer than that, over the long term, if you can be consistent about it, that's really, really going to pay off. What you might also find is that once you've sat down and once you've got started and you've gotten into the flow, you know, for a lot of us, five minutes is just long enough to be able to get ourselves into the zone and into the flow. And you might find that after five minutes, you don't want to stop. 
So either outcome is a great outcome, which is what makes the suggestion for getting started on really overwhelming or huge or complicated projects super effective. Big idea number eight is to make it fun. So even with projects that we love, even with projects whose reality we're like, yes, I want to be living that reality, there's always going to be little bits and bobs of it that are not super fun. Equally, there are some things that we have to do in life, like filing our taxes that, you know, we, we need to do as responsible citizens, but not necessarily like what we would choose to do <laughs> on any average weekend, right? And so for all of these kinds of tasks, whether the it's sort of something that you need to do as a project as a whole, or it's just a little moving part of a project that you're working on right now, really help yourself with these not fun tasks by making them more fun and doing what you can to get more joy out of doing them. Some of the ways that you can do this are doing things like listening to your favorite music while you're doing them, going and doing them somewhere else. You know, sometimes when I'm working on something that's kind of tricky or something that I'm not particularly looking forward to, I go and sit in the cafe and do it. I find that it helps me be more focused, just getting out of my flat and getting into a different environment changes the way that I look at things often as well. And it changes my perspective of that particular task. Um, you know, you can make your favorite beverage and some of your favorite snacks and sit down with that and just have kind of a chilled afternoon doing whatever it is you want to do. But the main thing is, it doesn't really matter what it looks like, but the main thing is that it's fun for you, right? Sometimes when we're faced with these tasks that we know we're not going to particularly enjoy, we tend to feel kind of heavy about them. They get kind of serious and that can turn into a bit of a vicious cycle where we're perpetuating this sense of, oh, I really don't want to do this. So if you're getting stuck right now on a task that is just not fun for you, think to yourself, how can I make this fun, right? How can I think outside the box and maybe do this in a slightly different way or do it in a different place or, you know, change my environment or add something or take something away? You know, what can I do to make this as fun as possible? Big idea number nine, act, then feel. One of the biggest myths in our culture today is this idea that we need to feel a certain way before we can take action. So something that I really commonly hear from uh, coaching clients and other people that I talk to is, I really want to do X, but I'm just not ready yet. I just don't feel ready. Or I really want to do Y, but I'm just not feeling motivated right now. So I'm going to wait. And then when I feel motivated, then I'm going to start doing it. The problem with this is that, as you probably know, if you've bought into that idea, which we all have at one point or another, I know I certainly have, is that if you wait to feel a certain way, you're going to be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for a very, very long time. And that's because the truth is that action precedes feeling, not the other way around. So if we want to feel motivated to do something, we need to do that thing first. Again, sounds very counterintuitive, but it's true. We need to do that thing first, and then we will feel more motivated to do that. A really great example for this is long distance running, right? I don't know about you, but I know very, very few people who will wake up on a Monday morning at 5 a.m. and think, you know what? It's Monday. It's 5 a.m. It's freezing. It's raining outside. It's dark. I'm really, you know, I can't wait to go running. Yeah, I'm really up for this. I'm feeling jazzed about it. I, I don't know about you, I don't. I know very few people, I can think of maybe one person I know <laughs> who would actually think that way, right? The vast majority of us would get up and we would recognize that we're not feeling like if you are a long distance runner, you'd recognize, well, actually, this these conditions are not ideal. I'm not really feeling it, but I'm going to do it anyway, because what long distance runners recognize and what people who are willing to take action before they feel really recognized is, is by taking that action, it's by getting out the door and starting running that leads to the motivation, right? The more we run, if you're a runner, to use that analogy, the more motivated you're going to feel to keep going the more you do it, right? But if we sit there waiting to feel that feeling first, we're going to be waiting for a very long time. This is especially the case with readiness, right? If you think about projects that expand our comfort zone, then of course we're not going to feel ready to do them because we are stepping into uncharted territory, right? We're doing something that maybe we've never done before. That's the whole point of expanding your comfort zone is you're widening that circle of experience. 
So of course you're not going to feel ready because at the, no at the moment, the part of you that is maybe coming up with all these reasons that you should doubt yourself and all these reasons why you can't do it, that part has no proof that you can actually do it. At the same time, we tend to underestimate our internal resources and our capability, especially when we're faced with new situations. So again, like I said earlier in this class, just because you think a certain thing or you feel a certain thing, just because you feel self-doubt or just because you uh, feel fear, that's not necessarily a sign that you shouldn't do something. So just remember that when, in terms of readiness, when you're expanding your comfort zone, it's perfectly natural not to feel ready, right? Because you are doing something that you haven't done before. However, by doing that thing, you know, just as action leads to mastery and it's by taking action that we can feel more confident in our mastery of a particular project or goal, whatever it is we're working on, by taking action, we will feel readier, right? So once you take action, once you take that leap of faith and you trust in your internal resources and capability and trust yourself to do something, the more you can do that, the more ready you will feel. Big idea number 10, and the final big idea for this class is remember it's ultimately about making a decision. This might sound infuriatingly simple, but it's so, so true. And like I said earlier in this class, you are in complete control of which path you take right now. You can take the path to start it, or you can stay on the path to stuck. It's really easy when we're feeling stuck to look for all these external answers and solutions to our problem, right? We might go and read books and I have talked to so many people who when you ask them, you know, that say they wanna learn another language or they wanna start a business and then I'll go back to them a few weeks later and say, how's that coming on? They'll say, oh yeah, I'm doing really well. I've read loads of books on the subject. And while I can see where they're coming from with that, as we all know, reading a book on the subject is not the same as actually doing that thing. So it's ultimately about making a decision. It's really easy to look for these external solutions. It's really easy to get involved in the um, R&D stage, right, the research and development stage, and feel like that is productive time. Sometimes it absolutely is productive time, but at the same time, I'll go back to what I said before, that we often have far more resources and capability than we realize and then we give ourselves credit for. The most helpful thing for you right now is just to make a decision to start and follow through on that decision as well. Again, sounds really simple. Maybe it sounds infuriatingly simple to you right now, but that's all it really comes down to. It's just making that decision, just choosing which path you are going to take and following through on that as well. I hope this class has been helpful to you and I would love to hear what projects you are working on at the moment. So if you want to log into the Oasis and leave a comment below this video, um, yeah, please, if you feel inclined to share, I would love to hear what big projects or goals you are grappling with right now and how you're getting on with them too. If you have any questions about this class, anything I've mentioned in it, or anything else to do with getting from stuck to started, you can visit becomingwhoyouare.net and contact me through that. Or you can email me at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Thanks again for watching this, and I wish you the best of luck with starting, and I hope you have a great day.